Hello everyone, this is Dirk van Damme from the OECD speaking. It's five o'clock here in Paris uh, and I welcome you all to this uh, webinar um, led by Charles Fidel and I will be the discussant. Um, we are now 127 people who have joined the webinar and but the number is still increasing so um, that's uh, that's actually uh, fascinating to see so many people interested in the competences learners need to succeed. Um, our main speaker of today is Charles Fidel. Um, Charles is um, the one of the authors of um, a book which actually inspired us to do this webinar, a book called Four-Dimensional Education, the Competencies Learners Need to Succeed. And um, without further ado, I will hand over to Charles and I will come back after his presentation to be the discussant of this book. Uh, to, uh, to you, Charles. Thank you very much, Dirk, and hello, everyone. Uh, let's do a sound check first. Uh, Dirk, am I audible properly? Yes, I can hear you very good. Okay, thank you. And so, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are around the world. It is my pleasure to be here. I am Charles Fadel, the founder and chairman of the Center for Curriculum Redesign. I left the technology world a few years ago to start this quest about not just how we learn better, but what should we be learning in the first place. We're trying to answer this question what should students learn for the 21st century? So for those of you who are uh, using Twitter, I will make you note the hashtag uh, at the bottom of the page, uh, hashtag 4DEDU. And I want to thank the OECD and in particular Dirk for uh, his kind uh, remarks and uh, his uh, collegiality over the years as well as Andreas, who has provided a prologue for the book. So let's start talking about what is happening around the world. And uh, with that, I'm going to switch to the next page and ask you to reflect for a second about who is the author of this painting. And if you want, you can always type in your answer in the chat field. And a lot of you will have probably guessed something along the lines of Jackson Pollock. So I want to show you something here. This painting that you suspected was Jackson Pollock is not at all drawn by human. It's not painted by human. It was painted by an algorithm. And I'm showing you here on this page that computers can sketch as well. So this was done by Disney. And it shows you how computers can mimic uh, a human draw, drawing. So this is important. This is showing you that endeavors of human capabilities, such as creativity, are now increasingly automatable. So yes. One can mimic the style of Pollock. One can mimic drawings of various artists. And going to the next page, one can also mimic the composition style of Bach and Beethoven and Mahler and a number of others. Unfortunately, given the limited bandwidth of a WebEx presentation, I cannot show you videos or have you listen to audio files, but you can go online and find those. And I would recommend you do that. You'll be surprised to see how experts are now fooled by compositions that resemble Bach and Beethoven or Pollock or others. And so we're at the threshold of a new era where artificial intelligence and robotics and a host of other technologies are really starting to significantly um, encroach on what were reserved intellectual human domains. And this is going to have a lot of uh, implications for not just how we learn, but also what should we be learning in the first place. 
So we know that the road ahead is challenging. We have technological disruptions, of course, but also climate change, personal privacy, financial instability, inequities, and so on, all, all uh, creating difficulties for humanities. And this is what the futurists have described as a VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. As a parenthesis, I realize that some of you are wondering what's happening with my voice cutting in and out or being unstable. I'm holding the microphone right in front of my mouth and trying to not move at all. So this is all I can do. I suggest you try ramping up the volume on your side if you can. I cannot make it any closer, otherwise it will sound very uh, noisy. So with that, we have a world that's become increasingly volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And yet at the same time, we know that human happiness and societal uh, fulfillment is about the entire Maslow pyramid, not just physiological safety and love and belonging and so on, but all the way up to self-transcendence. And employability, which is of course important, is related to the first, second, and fourth layer of that pyramid. And so our goal, of course, is fulfilled individuals for a sustainable humanity. Moving on, we know, of course, that there is a serious disconnect. We realize that people around the world are demanding jobs, justice, and education, as you can see from this uh, picture extract. We also know the worrisomely high youth unemployment that's plaguing countries uh, rich and poor alike. And there is a disconnect between employers and educators. Now, educators seem to be quite satisfied by the results of their outputs compared to what employers and the users themselves consider. You know, if you ask youth, are you adequately prepared, 38% of youth will say yes, whereas 74% of education providers say yes. So clearly there's a disconnect between what education is providing and what its customers, the youth, are asking for. If you look at what has happened over the past three decades, in the United States economy at least, we have seen skills changing, the requirements for skills changing. The tasks that were non-routine and analytical or interpersonal have risen, meaning consulting, engineering. Those occupations have risen in demand. And the ones that were more routine, be they manual or intellectual, like paperwork or assembly work, have dropped. What has also dropped is the demand for non-routine manual uh, uh, occupations, such as, for example, plumbing or truck driving. But there's only so much you can, you, we have been able to automate or offshore those so far. But keep that in mind for the rest of this conversation. Of course, the press is all over this and is realizing that there are st uh, storm clouds brewing, brewing that will eventually replace a lot of jobs. We've already seen the impact of offshoring. We are going to see the increased impact of automation as well, the two facets of what is actionable via technology. look at more detail. Familiar with autonomous vehicles. Uh, when we started talking about this a decade ago, uh, that seemed like a, a distant uh, hope or wish, if not science fiction. Now it's all over the press. That's what happens when technology progresses in exponential ways. I will remind all of you that the smartphone we have in our pockets is the equivalent of a Cray supercomputer from 1985. And at the time, it was just a cell phone. And so the progress has been made this astounding. And of course, at an exponential rate, the progress in the next 20 to 30 years to come is going to be all the more astounding. 
in the past 15 years, we've seen the emergence of computerized trading where, where algorithms battle each other. And so you've seen this progression here where 60% of the volume is now high-speed trading between mathematical formulas, algorithms. And every once in a while, they panic each other and provoke what you saw as the flash crash. Where you, you probably did not realize that 42% of Wikipedia is edited by bots, not by humans. And of course, it depends on the domain. But you see, this is again an application where automation makes a lot of sense to handle the volume of routine tasks. And look at this. This cartoon is from 2011. At the time, it was a joke. You know, schedule a meeting automatically and then Siri or, Cor or Cortana or whatever takes care of it. At the time, it was just a joke. And now it is a reality. You can have an application on the web that schedules your meetings for you. It's called Amy, and you see the URL down there on the page. So all these things that seemed like uh, science fiction or merely jokes back 5 to 10 to 15 years ago are now reality, and things are progressing along that path. So let's talk about the physical embodiment of some of these artificial intelligences, right? It's not only software or applications. It could also be physical embodiments. The physical embodiments don't need to look like a humanoid. It could simply be an automated chain to deliver hamburgers. And it produces, in this case, Momentum Machines produces 360 hamburgers per hour. It pays for itself very quickly. The ROI is fast, one year. And no cashiers, no servers. And of course, the automated voice will also remind you to buy fries with that. And so this is just another example of low-end jobs being automatable. But even higher-end jobs, like, for example, nursing, you can definitely imagine a future where some of the healthcare requirements will be handled by an automaton. Now, note something incredibly important here. The knowledge is shared online, and so one robot learns from the mistakes of a thousand other robots simultaneously. And so very, very, very quickly, they will all learn how to be, become better. Imagine if we as humans could learn this fast from each other, where we would be. It's unfathomable. And yet that's what um, these intelligences will be able to do with each other. And I'll remind you that there's no, not only one form factor. We don't have to wait for you know, a humanoid robot that looks like a human. It could be the vacuum cleaner called Roomba. It could be flying bots. And of course, we've seen drones all over the press in the past couple of years. But the research on drones has been going on for a long time. It's only now showing up in the popular press. So this displacement due to technology is not new. The oxen have been replaced, the horses have been replaced, the lab mice would like to be replaced, and the humans have been replaced by the printing press, the washing machine, the barcode scanner. This has been going on since the invention of the wheel and the domestication of fire. It's just that the rate of change is becoming astounding and is leaving a lot of people behind. New cognitive technology like IBM's Watson, have now been beaten the best at Jeopardy, the game Jeopardy, which is a semantic memorization game. And so not only uh, has the computer become best at chess, but also now at Jeopardy, and more in, even more recently, um, Google has beaten uh, a European champion of Go, the game Go which is a lot more difficult than chess because of all the combination. So this is just to show you how things are accelerating and the impact of artificial intelligence and robotics in particular. But these are not the only technologies. We also have augmented reality, where you're wearing a glass of some sort and it's giving you access to a screen floating in front of your eyes. 
and the University of Washington is working on a contact lens so that screen would literally be a contact lens in front of, you know, on your cornea, on your retina. And so you're now able to walk together with a partner in Lugano in this case and choose a restaurant and make a reservation as you're, uh, as you're visiting the city. And that's just one eye receiving that information. Imagine now if you have both eyes and you can plunge yourself in a completely virtual world. You're going to see a lot of artificial, I'm sorry, uh, augmented and virtual reality emerge in 2016 because a number of large corporate players are pushing very hard to make that technology accessible in the consumer domain this year. And so, of course, we know that these technologies have been used in training, particularly, for example, for airline pilots. And the education world will be under pressure to figure out how to use these technologies with everything else that's possible, again, for learning better, faster. And then there's another class of technologies with 3D printing, where you can print prosthetic limbs and, you know, uh, even cell-based replacement ears or kidneys or muscle or a liver. You can print titanium parts as in this case, uh, flown by GE on an aircraft, or drugs. There are a lot of things you can print from the ground up. And then there's the Internet of Things, another type of technology, whereas a lot of devices are connected to the Internet. And your refrigerator now is able to, detecting your quantified cell, to decide whether to open up or not because you've had too many calories today. Okay, that was a joke. It's hard to pass on over a WebEx session, not seeing the audience, but you see what I mean. The quantified self opens the interface with an enormous array of things, whether you're sick or simply exercising or whatever, you can interface with a lot of machines out there. And of course, that becomes your own private information that is all the more um, necessary to protect and to not tamper with them. And then brain enhancers. Well, so far we consider socially unacceptable to use enhancers like Adderall or Ritalin. But what if at some point we decided caffeine is no longer enough to keep us in the loop, to keep us in the game with all the devices that, and the intelligences we are creating? Perhaps there will be this need to tinker with ourselves cognitively with brain enhancers. And what if we decide to tinker with ourselves genetically with gene editing technologies such as CRISPR that are now available for a few thousand dollars and the consequences of that, ethical, wisdom-wise, these are going to really provoke enormous questions for humanity. And these are all questions that are developing now. We're not talking about science fiction 10 or 20 or 50 years from now. This is all happening now. And lastly, another type of technology, perhaps that one will be a little bit further out, which is nanomaterials, where we're creating materials from the ground up, atom by atom, and self-replicating machines, nanomachines. And so with all of this, you understand why William Gibson has said the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. That's so correct. All the technologies I've shown you are either already available or in the labs. It's just a question of when they're going to hit the consumer marketplace and how they will all be interacting with each other, which is completely unfathomable. Would you have thought a decade ago that you'd have a GPS in your smartphone that would send you a coupon when you're walking by your favorite restaurant? These technologies interact with each other and become multiplicative in their effects. And of course, the cloud is a huge accelerator. Now you have virtually unlimited computing power and memory storage at your fingertips via your smartphone. These are all game changers. And so, Richard Riley, who was Secretary for Education in the U.S. a few years ago, said that 
we are currently preparing students for jobs and technologies that don't yet exist to solve problems that we don't even know are problems yet. That is very true. But as educators, you're also thinking, well, but this has always been the case. So what exactly, why is, is this particularly new? Well, what is new is the rate of change. This is not like the rate of change of 50 or 100 years ago. This is astoundingly fast, and it's impacting all of us and our children. What is happening really is a repeat of the Industrial Revolution, perhaps even magnified. When, during the Industrial Revolution, technology zoomed ahead of education, and education fell behind. That created social pain. We're seeing a repeat of this with the digital revolution, where there's social pain being created because technology again has zoomed ahead. And it's up to us as educators to make sure that education catches up as quickly as possible to not leave so many people behind and create so many disruptions that are so painful. So with all of that, you understand why it was so compelling to, for me to start this center, to think about what is actually relevance in education nowadays. I'm not saying education was not relevant. I'm saying, well, how do we make it more relevant for the times at hand? Education has served an enormous purpose since the Industrial Revolution, of course, way before that, since the dawn of humanity. But how do we adapt it to the times? How do we think, how do we rethink this fundamental question? What should students learn? Not how, not just how, but also what should students be learning? How, what should we all be learning for the 21st century? We're already a decade and a half into it. It's grand time to adapt. Students, in the meantime, are begging for relevance. I'm sure you can all empathize with these little children when we were all young and asking ourselves, why am I learning this? What's the point? So exactly how am I going to use this? We're all wired for motivation, and motivation derives itself from relevance. If you don't see why something matters, you may be far less motivated to learn it. And so we have to make sure that this accent of relevance is constantly being cared for in our classrooms, but also into the standards and assessments in the first place. So the center that uh, I created a few years ago has already gathered a number of key global players. And you can see a number of high-end PISA jurisdictions that already do very well by PISA um, metrics but realize that the world doesn't stop at PISA. The PISA is perhaps the best there is in terms of uh, measurement of traditional knowledge areas with an accent on applicability. But there's, of course, a lot more than that. And that's what we're going to be talking about. We have a world that is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And as you might imagine, in a world that is like this, not knowing where things are going, versatility is a wise strategy, becoming a Swiss army knife, if you will, a Renaissance person that can adapt to the new requirements as they surface. This means we have to reassess knowledge for relevance and versatility, ask ourselves, what is relevant knowledge today with a fine grain, not coarse you know, dichotomies, but really think through what actually matters in this century. For instance, do we really need this much trigonometry, which was introduced at a time the world needed more land surveyors and woodworkers, or do we need a lot more statistics and probabilities and data science, because that's actually what we're all needing. Why do we crowd out important new knowledge areas and crowd out areas that are interdisciplinary by nature, such as robotics and entrepreneurship, well, and wellness, and so on? Why do they have to be left out? Why aren't they considered part of the core, of a modern core? And how do we take into account all these important themes that are cross-cutting? across a number of knowledge areas, such as global literacy, information literacy, systems thinking, and so on. 
so that they're not separate again as a specific course on global literacy that doesn't even make much sense. It really needs to be embedded everywhere. So as you are studying mathematics or robotics or sociology, you keep in mind the full behaviors, the full richness of a planetary experience of a humanity. And then the skills. The skills are how we use what we know and understand. And so our creativity, our critical thinking, our communication, our collaboration need to be paid attention to. Otherwise, the knowledge remains inert. And then our character. Our character, meaning here how we behave and engage in the world. As we all realize, as we have progressed through life, we realize it wasn't enough to know and understand and being able to act on that knowledge, but it's also how we acted that made a huge difference. It's our mindfulness, our curiosity, our courage, our resilience, our ethics, our leadership that made the difference. And that's what we're asking, be part of what we deliberately learn in school rather than as, a, as an afterthought. And lastly, same with meta-learning our ability to reflect and adapt and continue with our self-directed learning. And so our growth mindset, understanding how to remain positive and look forward, and our ability to reflect on ourselves at several layers of granularity, so our metacognition. And this is how we can visualize it all together. Meta-learning, of course, being the underlying dimension of these other three, right? Your knowledge, skill, character, and meta-learning were all. This is as comprehensive as we can make it, and yet as concise as we can make it. The two matter. You don't want to forget important elements, but at the same time, you don't want to overload it with so many dimensions and so many competencies and parameters that you simply cannot act on. This is meant to be actionable, global, crisp, and as comprehensive as possible. Now, of course, each jurisdiction, each locality will decide what matters for itself, what to focus on more or less. And for that matter, each individual will also have to make some of those choices as well. So this is a framework, a guideline. It's not a mandate but it's certainly something that helps educators think through the plethora of choices that they're being given. If you're a teacher, if you're a policymaker, you're getting inundated with requests. You're getting people from all ilk saying, teach creativity, teach entrepreneurship. How about courage? How about leadership? And you forgot metacognition and this and that and the other. How do you make sense of it all? Well, this is one way to make sense of it all. And to make even more sense of it all for you, it is possible to collapse skills, character, and meta-learning in a single uh, dimension. In this case, the X dimension on this table. And really what we are after is the intersection between knowledge on one side and these 12 competencies on the other side. There is no such a thing as creativity without knowledge behind it these things express themselves together. It's a false dichotomy to say knowledge or skill or character or metallurgy. These are all and propositions. And also we will realize that some of these competencies will need out of school development. It's really hard to imagine how we're gonna be teaching courage, for example, sitting in a classroom. And so, we have moved on from uh, 21st century skills, which def defined only one of these uh, Venn diagram circles you see, to really talking about the other dimensions as well. 21st century skills has become a moniker used around the world, and we realize that for it to take to gain hold, we really needed to express everything else in one view, so it actually made all sense together. Uh, Andreas was really very kind and uh, even recorded a short video that we have on the website describing uh, why he likes the book. I'll let you read here a short extract.
Okay. So I'd like to add a couple of more things uh, in conclusion. There's also the aspect of prescription versus choice. As the learner grows older, the percentage that's prescribed by society is going to drop, of course. And the percentage that's chosen by the individual, and for that matter, by the local environment, will rise. And this is something we have to build in to make sure that there is time and space allocated so that it's not all the time and space are not completely eaten up by what's mandatory or for that matter for from even what's optional. It should really be we should be reserving something along the lines of thirty percent of the time on average across all these years for uh, for agency of the learner. And so here comes the hard question. What do we remove? It's very easy, as we've seen around the world, to keep on adding, 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 not just in knowledge, but also these competencies. And the teachers are flustered. We keep on adding, we don't change the assessments, we don't change college entrance requirements, and then we wonder why things are not changing. How come the how is not producing the right results? Well, that's because the what is already sucking up all the time. And it's a hard thing to, re to do to remove things. You cannot just go and use a chainsaw and say, oh, well, we don't need any algebra. You see articles like this appearing in the press at times, but that's sensationalism. Of course we need algebra. Of course we need some trigonometry. The question is how much and for whom. And this is the hard con the conversation to have. It's a little bit like your household budget. Line item by line item, you can always justify this extra cup of coffee or that restaurant or whatever expense, that ski vacation you've taken in aggregate, though they might have broken your budget. And so this is the hard part, going back and really analyzing knowledge domain or their cognitive density. What, is, what are the areas of higher cognitive density that matter more? Meaning not just the subjects and branches, although some of them can be added, but also the methods and tools and processes we want the learners to understand deeply. And also, above and beyond that, what are the concepts and meta-concepts that are applicable across a range of disciplines and transfer to other disciplines? For instance, in mathematics, the tool would be, for example, to derive, how to derive, but the concept is rate of change, and that is valid across a range of disciplines. So that when Zika or Ebola or global warming start rising, you understand that the rate of change is accelerating and there's something here you need to pay attention to. It's no longer linear. And that's the sort of deeper understanding, deeper curation that needs to take place about knowledge. Again, what are these areas of higher cognitive density. To give you another example, the concept of proof, the meta-concept of proof in mathematics and the meta-concept of proof in philosophy and how the two relate. What is an unassailable proof versus what's the debate around whether anything can be fully proven and all the gray areas in between. So you see, these are all examples about how we need to rethink what matters in knowledge. And that's the sort of challenge we're all going to be facing really soon. Now, what are the difficulties? The difficulties are, first of all, political. Is it acceptable to remove some trigonometry when you have the union of architects being very unhappy with you as a politician? And yet, you know that statistics and probabilities would matter a lot more. There's an issue of churn, be it either within people's job roles within a given department or ministry, but also the change of parties in power, and sometimes the throwing the baby with the bathwater, as the expression goes. You know, everything is cleaned up, new broom, as they say. Whether it made sense or not, it was, if it was done by the other party, it's by definition a bad thing to do, which is observed, of course. 
And then there's the dogma. You know, uh, when you bring experts of a given discipline, there's a certain dogma, there's a certain confirmation bias of everyone in that discipline, because that's what things have been done for the past many decades. And there's a certain group thing that goes on around the world, meaning a given jurisdiction might be afraid of removing something for the fear of falling behind or adding something. And then there's the complexity of assessments, right? How do we assess not just our knowledge, but also these 12 competencies that I've described along the lines of skills and character and meta learning? And lastly, can any of this change if the college entrance requirements do not change and the inertia behind it? And that's what needs to be paid attention to. So all of these have to change, and that's what we're embarked on. And our value proposition as a center is to be free from local constraints, local political constraints, and to be able to work with expert from, experts from a broader range of disciplines than is typical. And so when we come up with recommendations, starting with mathematics, as you'll find on our website, and pursuing on over the next few years, we will be able to solve some of these difficulties that are faced by jurisdictions hand in hand with some of them. And in conclusion, we have to keep in mind that we cannot solve a problem without really revisiting what it is about. We must see the world anew with fresh eyes, and that's what we're bringing to this conversation. And with that, I thank you very much, and uh, we'll let uh, Dirk lead the conversation from here on. I'm very grateful for your presence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, I heard you already speaking several times, and every time there are new elements that um, speak to my imagination and my thinking. So thank you again for this um, presentation. I will now uh, take up my role as a discussant, and um, for 10 minutes or so, I will uh, briefly reflect on, on your work and on the book uh, more in particular. Um, let me say that education sometimes is a very complicated field, that people ask many sophisticated questions. But as many things in life, um, most important ones are actually very simple questions. And the question, what do we need to learn in the 21st century, is, is actually such a question. Um, Four-dimensional education is not a very complicated book. Uh, I can really recommend it to read and to study the book, but it's not a really very sophisticated scientific uh, book with a lot of uh, references, etc. A layperson will have no difficulties in reading it, and that's one of the big merits of the book. But the sophistication is in the thinking behind the book. Um, and that's actually the, the big merit. I'm also convinced that education needed someone from the outside to produce this work um, and to put these questions on the table. And as is often the case, um, within a scientific discipline or within a system of professional practice, people do not longer see the really important questions and, until someone from the outside comes and say, uh, wait a minute, what's going on here? Um, one of the big merits of the book, it, it, it's changing the conversation from the how to the what. Um, and what do I mean with that? Um, I think a lot of discussions, research, writings on educational innovation is about changing the teaching and learning process learner-centered education, moving away from frontal education, um, bringing more fun into the classroom, etc., etc. And of course, that's, that's important, but we have been focusing too much of our energy, I think, on the how of education. And some people, like Charles, have um, shaken that uh, some t somehow naive consensus and asked, what we really expect education to bring to children and to the to the world, wider world. Um, the real significance of the book is 
that it rethinks curriculum development radically, and I mean with radically from its roots, from its foundations. Um, from the, for the first time, someone really asks what could be dropped from the school curriculum, and not only what should be added. A lot of curriculum redesign in the world going on is adding things to curricula. Curricula have accumulated human knowledge from the past, and now um, someone asks us, yeah, but is that still very relevant? Shouldn't we drop a number of things? And I must admit, I myself, being an educator and an education policy maker, I was a bit hesitant to do that and to think that's true, um, because every single subject field, every single topic uh, has its merits and its strong um, proponents and people who really think that this is a crucial bit of knowledge or this is a crucial, a critically important skill or whatever. Um, but it is certainly the case that too often in education we think that what has worked well in the past will also automatically work well in the future. And one of the big merits of the book is that this, that it demonstrates that this is such a big fallacy. In curricula, the weight of the past is huge. Education policy makers, teachers, researchers, they all fear the stigma of being accused of changing uh, things too rapidly, of throwing the child with the bathwater, um, in an environment which is intrinsically conservative. Um, in education, we, we face the problem that all the rewards goes against critical thinking, goes against radical innovative change, because everyone seems to refer to how good it was in, the, in their own past and how things have evolved mainly for the worse. So I think that's, that's one of the very big merits of, of the book. Most or at least many of what is said in the book has been said before. I think the main element is that no one has brought it together in such a clear, thorough and actionable way. For example, what Charles and his colleagues write about journalism, it reminds um, an educator very much of what the French educational innovator and pedagogue Celestin Frenet um, developed nearly 100 years ago. Um, that piece of element is, is very similar to well-known uh, pedagogical writings. But the, the merit is that it has been brought together in an overarching framework and in a, a taxonomy which has orthogonal dimensions which includes categories which are mutually exclusive. Um, and it's actually the, the, the overarching, the comprehensive nature of the intellectual exercise which is uh, so compelling. Uh, a really fundamental concept in the book is that of time. And you will not find the word too many times, but um, I think the really question in the back of Charles' mind is how fast is the environment changing? Do we have enough time to adapt education to the accelerating pace of technological development? The theory of educational history in the book, which draws heavily on Golden and Katz, and of course Golden and Katz is not without its criticism, but the, the, the theory is compelling but also the notion of exponential change, the increasing pace of change. Um, education has been very slow in adapting to successive industrial revolutions. We, we know that very well. The first industrial revolution developed modern mass cooling with the idea that it would equip all people with the very basic skills for working in factories. And the second industrial revolution invented technical and vocational education to produce skilled workers. It introduced contemporary math and science in the curricula, which were very much neglected in the past. The third industrial revolution has not yet brought about huge changes, and the fourth already is on the doorstops. So do we have enough time to change education to match the needs which are emerging in the environment. The power of 
four-dimensional education is that it leaves the reader with no excuses left. Just like something like the latest report on climate change, it, it tells you you have to act now before it's too late. Many books on education in the 21st century suffice with criticizing the present. Education, the four-dimensional education does that, but it also lays out a program of building the future, and that's very, very attractive. So let me finish here by saying that I found this personally a, a marvelous book. It, it, it invites you to think um, in a way that not many books do. I have a few critical questions as well, of course. Um, the first one is, what I miss most in the book is a theory of action. Um, the book seems to assume that what is taught in schools will also guide the learning of children. And I think conceptually, but also from a more pragmatic uh, point of view, that's, that's a bit naive. Uh, what, in thought, what is taught in schools, of course, changes students, but not always in the desired direction. Um, so we need to have a kind of theory of action on making the bridge between what is taught in schools to what students learn, and then what the, the, the outcomes will be, both at an individual and at a social level. You need to conceptually distinguish teaching from learning and then from the social outcomes. The second element or question or comment is that uh, I think um, the book does not yet completely deliver on its promise to enabling policymakers and educators to make critical choices. Um, so we, we need to, to have a kind of translational exercise to develop the taxonomy and the dimensions and the constructs into curriculum development. Curriculum development does not follow automatically from, let's say, the, the taxonomies and the dimensions. For example, we need to understand very well what kinds of cons what kinds of transfers can happen between knowledge domains, between skills, because we need to be very selective in curriculum development, and Charles has reminded us of that. We need to avoid overloading the curriculum once more. But we need to think more loudly and, and more critically about what kind of knowledge, what kind of skills do we need to produce the outcomes that we want um, to produce. Um, and for that we need a, a theory of transfer. We need uh, maybe by developing a certain element of knowledge among students, we will have also effects on other domains, on skills, for example, or on values, or on character. Um, so there is a gap between, let's say, the, the taxonomy and the dimensions, and then the work that needs to be done in, in curriculum development. The third comment is um, that I well, first of all, let me say that one of the th things that I really like in the book is that what I would like to call the pedagogical optimism. It is really refreshing to read a book these days which is so pedagogically optimistic. Um, but the book also risks to be a little bit the victim of it. Um, it is sometimes a bit naive, at least for an educational researcher, in thinking that what is taught is also learned. That was my first point. But also the other way around, not everything that needs to be learned should be taught. Um, so there is um, a kind of view still in the book that we need to redesign education and redesign curricula uh, for the better, but we don't need to do everything in a curricula. Um, and that brings me to my final point. Um, it is very silent on the learner. It is generally accepted, though, that curricula should also foster the autonomous self-directed learning. Um, and that's not included in the term meta-learning. But one of the important questions in curriculum development these days, how much air should a curriculum have for individual choices, for the unexpected, and also for the joy of learning? Um, I would not like to see 
the book tra being translated in a superficial way in, uh, again, a new wave of overloaded curricula. We need lighter curricula. We need more space for the learner. We need more air in the curriculum. So we need to think more critically on, on translating the overarching frameworks in actual curricula. Um, but let me finish by saying that these comments are just the result of a reflection that the book has stimulated, uh, at least um, uh, in, in my case. Um, and uh, the, it is very rare that I read a book which is capable of, of stimulating so much my own development and also the development of thinking in the OECD where we will turn to curriculum development issues also um, in the in the very near future. Um, so let me finish here. Um, I think we now have the opportunity maybe to um, come back to some questions you might have, but I would like to first give the floor back to Charles uh, to say a few words maybe in reaction to my um, to my intervention or maybe some other things that he wants to share with us. Thank you so much, everyone. Derek, thank you. thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to have these conversations with you and thank you for all the kind words about the book and how it stimulated your thinking. I think we feed off each other in this uh, feedback loop. While talking about feedback loop, this is really what it is. There's a feedback loop between the what and the how. And we know how important it is to be holistic and reductionist at the same time. So we wanted to really focus on the what, <coughs> excuse me. And that's why we have not seen some of the topics you brought up being addressed. Uh, the impact on the learner, for example, which you brought up last, was addressed by saying very quickly that there needed to be more time and space available and choice available for the learner. I mentioned 30% of the total time. But that's, of course, not enough. Um, and you're absolutely right. Even in the remaining 70%, it could still be made a death march to cover, you know, in the 70%, what would normally be covered in 150%. So there is absolutely the fear that unless we seriously clear up um, the docket, we may end up with even more overload. And that's why it's really a zero-based budgeting approach, revisiting every discipline in the light of what is absolutely necessary from the ground up and how it relates to other disciplines and whether another discipline would be better suited to handle a given competency. For instance, do we really expect mathematics to develop courage? Well, probably not. Resilience, perhaps, yes but probably not physical courage. That would be unsuitable. And so let's not expect to have a correspondence in every single cell of that matrix. That would be silly. Let's figure out which can be ha what can be handled best by which discipline. And so I guess that goes to the question of uh, how do we make these choices from a curriculum construction standpoint? Um, well, that will be developed as we go, as I mentioned, zero-based budgeting approach, but also realizing how we're going to be um, filling that matrix and what hard choices we're going to make. This is a process that we're going to be developing. Uh, we have already started with mathematics and we'll continue along those lines. And we will learn as we go. I'm not convinced that this has been done before. We've seen elements of this being done here and there, I don't know that anyone has taken on this task uh, from the ground up. We will definitely do our due diligence uh, as we continue embarking on this effort. And as I said, we are starting with mathematics uh, at the request of um, OECD because this is such a crying need around the world. Then to the question about um, the optimism. Well, you know, I could be really pessimistic, too, uh, looking at the problems that we are facing around the world. And so um, I think it is important to keep the view that education can catch up. Now, of course, the optimism that Dirk was talking about was really related to thinking that what is taught is also learned by students. Yes, 
that's why we're saying what, the goal is really what is learned, not necessarily what is taught. And if there are other ways to learn a given nugget of some sort, be it. We're not wedded to a single approach. And again, as, as we left the how to others, curriculum and instruction and professional development will be handled by others. As we focus on the what, we will make explicit the linkages between the what and the how. To take a very, very simple, a couple of very simple examples, if we know so well that language acquisition works so well through immersion, well, why do we stretch students for so long in a, such an inefficient way if, for those who can afford it, find a way to have immersion or at least uh, tutors from around the world? Or in mathematics, if we can accelerate uh, some computation via the use of software, why not do that and free up a lot of time for deeper rethinking of what the algorithm means in the first place? So we really do want to get there, and I'm sure Sari will be a huge contributor and, um, and collaborator with us to figure these out. Lastly, regarding the theory of action, it is true, and I agree with you, Dirk, uh, we have made the logical leap uh, that if we go, if we do all this, then we will eventually improve education and we will eventually improve uh, the outcomes for humanity. Um, we will document those steps better in the next version of the book. Uh, I think we've made that leap because we thought it was uh, something people would agree with, uh, let's say, intuitively. But you're absolutely right that it could be expressed a lot more crisply as well. So we will do that. And so with that, um, I suppose we can open the floor to the questions. Oh, one more thing. I've been displaying here off my screen uh, the, uh, the book itself. It's called Four-Dimensional Education. The old one, dating back to 2009, is 21st Century Skills. That's why I put a yellow X on it and wrote down old book. Um, it, uh, it was the precursor and it uh, laid the groundwork for the skills aspect of the conversation. But clearly we are into, deep into the 21st century and clearly it's more than just about skills. So I would uh, suggest that uh, uh, you uh, uh, procure in one way, shape or form uh, this, uh, this, uh, this new book. We are preparing a PDF version that will be ready at the end of the week. And uh, if you send us an email, you see my address, charles at curriculumredesign.org. Again, charles at curriculumredesign.org. We'll be happy to send you the link. So with that, um, how, Dirk, would you like to handle the question? Yes, Charles, um, thank you so much. Um, okay, folks, we are ready to take any questions that you might have. Uh, the easiest uh, way to proceed is that you just uh, use the chat function and you formulate a question that you would like to ask to Charles or to myself or to both of us. Um, I have uh, here one question from a colleague from Greece. I will first read it. Um, I maybe give them a little bit my interpretation. Uh, the question goes as follows. What would be the core knowledge for everyone to have when we talk about equity in education? In Greece, with the refugees problem next year, it is envisaged that many more children no, with no knowledge of Greek language will enter the classroom. What will be the core knowledge to transmit to them? And how can the teachers be supported? Um, I'm, I'm reading this, this question a little bit um, in, in this way that maybe it's a, a bit risky to answer um, the question is about curriculum in a very abstract way because there are always changes in, in the environment and sometimes these changes can be rather very drastic and uh, very challenging uh, as, as is the case now with the refugee problem in Europe. Um, I would uh, say that um, the idea in curriculum reform is, of course, that there is a body of knowledge which and, and skills and character attributes which 
um, can enable people to respond to many changes in the environment. But um, a, f a curriculum needs to be flexible. I think um, the challenges now uh, in the refugee crisis with regard to language learning are, are so important that um, any sensitive school will, of course, adjust its curriculum and try to meet the demands for for second or fourth uh, or third or fourth language learning. So um, it's it's again the question of, about what is the core and what is the the flexible uh, circle around the core in terms of um, curriculum development. But maybe I give the floor to Charles uh, to share his reflection on this question. Well, thank you, Dirk. You're absolutely right that uh, crisis situations are different. You know, we're talking about the difference between a band-aid or a tourniquet to stanch the bleeding versus a, a longer duration, more systematic uh, program of studying. And the two are different answers, right? It's a bit like, uh, let's say, a quick certification so we can get a job versus a true education that's more fundamental and much more enc encompassing than just a certification. And so let's not confuse the two. Uh, one is a short-term pressing issue, and one is a longer-term issue. Now, the question, of course, is what is core in the first place? Well, of course, the most basic core is numeracy and literacy. But beyond that, you have to reflect, well, so by middle school, what are those concepts that everybody should have learned? You know, if uh, we understand, for example, what an exponential does, isn't that an important concept because it affects medical issues like Ebola and Zika, environmental issues like global warming. Even refugee inflows are going to follow an S-curve, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a sort of deeper understanding that would be required. And that's what we are endeavoring to start revisiting from the ground. Yes, Charles, I'm afraid we lost you. Uh, at least the sound is fading. Okay. Uh, well, as I said, ah. uh, this is what we're going to be revisiting from the ground up, and I stopped there. Uh, it's, okay. it's a working progress question. There's, it's not going to be solved in uh, you know, 30 seconds on a phone call, I'm afraid. Sure. I have here another question. Um, it's. Um, and it's, I think, very interesting for you, Charles, to reflect on this. The question is, what do you think is the weight of character in success? Well, it's not just my uh, way of thinking about this. You know, uh, you have uh, Nobel Prize winners. Uh, Dirk, uh, remind me of his name. He was in Sao Paulo with us. Um, James Heckman. Jim Heckman, of course. Uh, who's done a lot of research on uh, the, the determinant of what we call here character on success later in life, and in particular in early childhood education. And so it's been shown time and time again that uh, it's how we react to events, it's how we engage in the world that makes a difference. It's not only what we know. The odd thing, I have to say, getting into this field uh, more than a decade ago is realizing that all of these debates, as Dirk was saying earlier, they are not only in the first 21st century. They're not only part of this book. These debates go back to Socrates versus Aristotle and Thales. You know, Socrates having a much broader view of what an education was, Aristotle and Thales making it a lot more, let's say, academic. And that has perdured. We've seen this toggling. We've seen Benjamin Franklin, for example, advocating for much broader education. And uh, conversely, um, uh, others you know, advocating for a narrower view. But because education is handled by academia, typically it reflects the biases of those who have specialized into a specific domain. And so it's hard for someone who's specialized to also adopt a broader view. Note that I have said also, because it's not the dichotomy between breadth or depth, it's breadth and depth. And so it's the latitude to make careful decisions about where we're going to spend a lot more time to go deeper. Hence this concept of cognitive density. 
uh, one of the questions that came online was, can you expand more on that? Well, let me give you another example. If you're studying Greek history, do you really think that uh, the Minoans and the Sea People, or even the battles against the Medes, have as much importance as the emergence of scientists and philosophers, or the emergence of democracy in Athens, or the emergence of autocracy in Sparta? And how these two political systems emerged for different reasons, adopted a different strategy, were successful for different reasons, and both collapsed for different reasons. Isn't that what we're trying to really learn? Or again, is it just the context of battles and so on? Again, it's not one or the other. It's really what matters that needs to be focused on versus what's more contextual, which could be flown over in a more chronological or you know, appropriate way. And again, so this is again what I keep bringing back over and over. I find education being full of false dichotomies, knowledge or skills or character or meta-learning, um, depth or breadth, et cetera. If we do this right, this is important, if we do this right, we are going to be able to teach more subjects and topics in less time and more deeply, and yet at the same time teach these competencies. I can guarantee you that. It requires the courage to go back and revisit line item by line item what should be done in the first place so we free up the time and space. We have a big challenge ahead of us for the next uh, five years at least. Thank you, Charles. Um, I have a longer question here from a colleague from Poland or another Eastern European country, and I will read it. I have a question for Charles. I organize leadership forum in higher education in Poland for Central and Eastern European higher education institutions. This May we will be discussing employability as a result of thoughtful education and the internationalization of the curriculum. Although in the midst of preparations for my event, I sometimes worry that this part of Europe is barely ready to officially ask whether to change some begin to look at how to change the learning environment, and very few dare to ask the what question. I fully subscribe to your line of thinking and would like to know what words of encouragement you could offer to a variety of institutions here, small and large, to keep working towards that 21st century education framework. Well, I'm going to put my hat, my BIAC hat on. Uh, one thing I didn't uh, mention earlier on is that I'm chair of the Education Committee of the Business and Industry Advisory Committee to the OECD, representing around 50 employer organizations from around the world. And I can tell you employability matters too. Again, it's one of those false dichotomies. It's not employability or happiness in life. It's both. You know, the, the, looking at the Maslow Pyramid, these things are linked. It's not just being employable and not just have a job and a certification in which you're miserable. It's also being happy in what it is you're doing and fulfilled. So it's really the intersection between all these things we're talking about. And so it is perfectly appropriate and I completely encourage you to continue in that direction and also make sure that people understand that this is not one or the other. It's not employability or happiness. It's both and employers care about both. We want fulfilled employees, even if for uh, selfish reasons, never mind altruistic reasons. So it's perfectly appropriate. And it's perfectly appropriate to ask even the context of lifelong learning, what exactly matters? Not just in case learning, but just in time learning and just what I need learning. So the right blend is where we're going to have to go with all these things, and it's always a difficult conversation. And I just encourage you to stay the course, because a lot of naysayers will come through year after year after year, but will fade away after a little while. It's the steady hand that eventually makes the change, and it's people like you that are needed for make that change in so many places. And so I really encourage you and I thank you for having that courage. You're an example of what we're talking about. Thank you, Charles. Um, I have another question here, um, I guess, from someone from Thailand. 
Um, hello, I thank you for your presentation and discussion. I would like to ask either Dirk or Charles, how would the four dimensions of education and the principles underlying them translate in developing context? And what are the prerequisites for an education system to be able to deliver them? I would assume competent teachers, open system, and a learning culture are among the necessary preconditions. In a system which lacks these qualities, would you not say that four-dimensional education is rather difficult to achieve? Um, let me give you my, my immediate personal reaction. Um, I honestly don't think there is a kind of theory of development in education which uh, goes from poor to rich environments. Um, I have seen too many examples in my life of um, environments, educational systems or approaches with, where you could say, well, this is an example of how in a challenging environment people are really capable of doing much better than in a, an environment which is supposed to be, to be rich. I think um, developed countries really face the problem that the burden of the past is much more heavy than the um, invitation of the future. And I think probably you would need a certain basis of development of your educational system, but that um, people working in developing or emerging contexts actually have a lot of um, yeah, a lot of opportunities, sometimes even more than in uh, fully developed uh, economies. Look at the educational enthusiasm in Eastern Asian economies where the value put in education um, is capable of generating so much social energy, uh, social uh, force among educators that um, they are capable of achieving so beautiful results. And I'm not now um, cherishing East Asian education, I'm just saying that an emerging context is unleashing a lot of social energy which can work towards um, uh, a better future. Um, Charles, do you have any thoughts on, on this issue? Well, you've covered it really well. I'm simply going to add a couple of simple things. First of all, developing countries have a lot more entrepreneurs. A lot more. You know, if you look at the Kaufman Foundation's work on entrepreneurship, you'll find out that places like Bolivia, 60% of the population is an entrepreneur. So, yes, because you have to do it. And so there are places where some of these new knowledge domains and new character qualities are actually already being lived. You know, these people are a lot more resilient and a lot more courageous already. So don't uh, sell yourself short as a developing economy, you already have a lot of these character qualities and skills and some knowledge areas. It's just that you have to formalize it and broaden it to the entire population. And so you also can teach the rest of the world how it is you're coping with adversity. And that's some of the contributions we would want to see. That said, when you translate it into a formal education environment, it is clear that your teachers will need upskilling. And that's valid actually for all teachers around the world. So don't feel you're alone in that challenge. Thank you, Charles. That links very well to one of the last questions here on the, on the chat. Um, is it a realistic vision? What about the teaching professionals that will be needed to deliver such a renewed curriculum? Yeah. Will it well, not? of course, it is a great yeah. question, but let me phase things. If we start with professional development without changing the curriculum and instruction, then the teachers get frustrated. If we, we cannot change the curriculum and instruction before we change the assessments, and we cannot change the assessments until we have revisited the standards. So I completely agree that at some point, professional development will matter. But first and foremost, we have to change the first two legs of the elephant, the standards and the assessments, the, the what. Because the back two legs, the how, have been moving for a little while, but they can't push the elephant forward until the what legs start moving. 
And that's really what needs to occur so that the whole elephant moves. All four legs have to be moving, not only the back two. And so be, be a little bit patient with us as we start freeing up the system by starting to move the front two legs, then teacher development can catch up. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Charles. Um, I have someone here who is asking a question. I will not read it uh, completely, but basically, is the four-dimensional framework intended to underpin um, all other frameworks uh, across primary, secondary, and tertiary education? So basically, the question is, what is the, the reference point in the educational life cycle of students? Is it focusing mainly on secondary school education, or has it a wider um, relevant and a, a wider applicability. It is actually, in my opinion, quite applicable across that uh, and beyond. Meaning, it's applicable in a pre-K, pre-kindergarten thinking, you know, in uh, early childhood development thinking for a parent, or for a nursery school. It's applicable for higher education. It's applicable for workforce development, which is, um, of course, one of my hats in the workforce development. So it's a continuum that can benefit from this. Uh, crisper thinking about what matters, the specific implementations will be, of course, age appropriate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I haven't seen any more questions on the chat. Uh, many people ask for uh, a copy of the presentation, and we will be happy to uh, put the presentation on the uh, on one of the websites of the OECD. Um, I think okay. uh, you uh, can... Make sure we talk, uh, Dirk, so that I can send you the, the updated one, uh, the updated PDF. Okay. Uh, do that automatically. I would like to, to work with you on the process. Yeah, very good. Um, maybe you, you also want to put it on the uh, website of the Center for Curriculum Redesign, Charles? Yeah, that's a possibility as well. So let's okay. Us what's the most efficient way to do that for everyone's benefit? And then, uh, just to remind people that um, you can send an email to Charles if you want the PDF version of the book. Um, the email address is charles at curriculumredesign.org. Um, and uh, I think you said, Charles, that the PDF would be available in a few days but towards the end of the week or something like that. Exactly. And, um, and of course, for those of you who can afford to buy the book, be aware that 100% comes to the center because we are self-publishing. So this is not going to be going to a publisher. Um, we get 100% of the revenue to help support the center and the continuation of the thinking, which we hope you have enjoyed. So thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. Um, it's time now to, to close the webinar. Um, we had at one point in time uh, 200 participants. Um, that's, that's excellent. Uh, I would like to thank you all for your interest in these issues. Um, and I thank uh, in particular, of course, Charles for not only producing this book, but also um, animating this uh, and presenting this presentation at this webinar. Um, it's now yeah, 18 minutes past 6 in Paris, so for those in Europe, good evening, and for other people, have a nice day um, and a continuation of your activities today. Okay, thank you so much. Right. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.